Uh, last week we were back in James and we were looking that James taught us that wisdom is a key factor in understanding how to be joyful in the midst of trials. Uh, it doesn't come naturally to be joyful in the midst of trials. It feels quite unnatural for ma modern men and women in particular because we feel we're exempt from it and we talked about three reasons. We said that technology is one reason why you know, our advancement, we, we really should be exempt from all the suffering and trials. We said that uh, we have a misunderstanding of sin, that sin is just something we do on occasion instead of being part of our nature. So we dismiss the um, understanding of, of sin. And thirdly, we said that we, we think we can expect to face trials and suffering meaningfully without an understanding of or an admittance that God is and God is with us and God is part of our lives. So uh, that's a worldly view of suffering. But Christians have a really uh, a, a robust and, and a ability to understand and be, participate in suffering and expect it um, because we have the spiritual resource to address it. And that spiritual resource is joy, right? And wisdom to see the joy in our sufferings. We don't naturally get that wisdom. Wisdom is something we need to ask for. James tells us very directly, if you don't got it, you can ask for it. And God will give it uh, at, happily, willingly, and generously. Wisdom is gifted by God through His Word and the work of the Holy Spirit, helping us get it, helping us understand the meaning of it all. So that's a recap from last week, last couple of weeks. But James continues on in this theme around uh, addressing our uh, joy and suffering. And in what we're about to read today is, uh, I think, can be broken down into three basic misunderstandings that we have when it comes to trials. Now, the first misunderstanding is misunderstanding around our social status. The second misunderstanding is a misunderstanding around ourselves. And the third misunderstanding is a misunderstanding of God. Okay? So the first is around social status, second around ourselves, and third is around God. Addressing three misunderstandings. Uh, let's turn to today's passage, and we'll see uh, shortly that there seems to be the sudden shift in topic. And the sudden shift in topic seems to talk about the rich and the poor, and the question we have to ask ourselves as we read this is, how on earth does this fit in to what we were just, uh, what James has just been talking about? So let's dig in. Before we dig in, James chapter 1 verse 9, let me pray. Uh, thank you God for your word. Thank you for James. Thank you for the experience that he had on this earth as uh, being so close to you as your uh, half-brother. And then uh, taking what he learned from you through the uh, Sermon on the Mount through the way he co communicates to us, similar to Proverbs, Lord, and helps us to understand very directly and very clearly uh, that you're no nonsense, God, that you have, have told us exactly the way, how to live, how to uh, come to you. And we pray, Lord, as we look in this today, that we take stock of where we place our, our hope and our faith and that we would turn our hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse 9 through 12 is the first chunk we're going to do. We're going to go all the way through 18, but it's kind of divided in these three chunks. James 1, 9 says, Let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his exaltation, but let the rich boast in his humiliation, because he will pass away like a flower of the field. For the sun rises, and together with the scorching wind, it dries up the grass, its flowers fall off, its beautiful appearance perishes, and in the same way the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. Blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Uh, James, I thought we were talking about trials. What's up with this whole poor, rich thing? Uh, let's talk about that. The passage brings up two kinds of people. A person of humble, poor, limited means, humble circumstances, and the opposite, a rich dude. Um, where is this coming from? 
Some people think that the book of James is kind of like Proverbs. You know, Proverbs is like a lot of singular sayings that may not seem to have much relationship to each other. Um, I believe they do, but they seem like they can be taken as one-off pieces of wisdom. Kind of like if you were to grab a big bag of fortune cookies. You crack each one of those open and you read it and you're like, oh, that's good. And you crack another one open and you read it. Oh, that's good, but they're not really connected to each other. And some people think James is exactly that. That he's off on some tangent talking about rich and poor. But I don't think that's the case here. In fact, uh, James is very focused. I think he has a very coherent structure to the way he writes. And his point is related here around poor and rich is directly related to what he's talked about in verses 1 through 8 we've talked about in the last couple of weeks. Let me give you the biggest clue to why I think this is true. Look at verse 12. What does verse 12 say? Verse 12 says, Blessed is the one who endures trials. Think about this. He is bookending and coming back and circling back to everything he just talked about in verses 1 through 8. Consider it all joy when you face trials of many kinds and then goes on to make his argument. So if he's putting the sandwich together of bread on, of trials on one side, trials on the other side, the meat in the middle is going to support exactly what he's trying to get across, this point that he's trying to get across, which is of course um, uh, the, the joy in trials. So this big clue about blessed is the one who endures trials. We then have to ask ourselves this question. Who are these people? The lowly, the poor, and the rich? And more importantly, how is their relationship to God? If you read this, that the brother of humble circumstances is a believer, which it implies it's a brother, right? You're a brother, you're like a believer. Uh, you're a brother of humble circumstances. If you believe that, but you also believe that what he's talking about is a rich believer as well, then you can come to the summary that what James is trying to tell us is whether you're rich or poor, you should you know, still live with Christian faith and it really doesn't matter what lot you have in life and just live by the gospel, which is a perfectly good way to look at this, okay? And we do believe that you can be rich or poor and be a believer. But I don't think that's his point. His point, I think, is a little bit different because I believe he's saying uh, that there are uh, a difference between poor believers and rich unbelievers. Let me tell you why I think this is the case. Turn quickly to chapter 2 verse 5. In chapter 2 verse 5 he says this, Didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? And so he's saying if you love him and you're poor, you're gonna get you're gonna get God's riches, His kingdom. Yet you have dishonored the poor. So he's talking. He's talking to the scattered. He's talking to the church, and he's saying you have not been acting like the Christian that who loves God. In fact, you've been acting like the rich. He says this: Don't the rich oppress you, and drag you into court? Don't they blaspheme the good name that was invoked over you? In other words, he's saying in chapter two. Clearly, the rich are not believers. They are blaspheming the name of God. They are oppressing the poor. They are dragging them into court. And James thinks that the rich in chapter 2 are the same people in chapter 1. In fact, we could even go to chapter 5. We're not going to do that right now. But you could go to chapter 5 and find the exact same argument. And so the way he, he identifies the rich uh, throughout the rest of the book is as non-believers, they're not acting like Christians if they are, certainly. So we're going to assume that in chapter 1, he's saying that there's the poor believers and the rich non-believers. So I want you to think about this. James has been telling us that trials, I'm talking about trials and how to face them, and what does it do for us? It gives us endurance, it leads to maturity, and one of these trials that you're going to face is this trial of a rich person oppressing you. A person who has it and you think that you have nothing and therefore you are nothing. That's what our world tells us. If you want to be something in this world, you better have your act together and show that you've got a little bling on your neck, you've got the right uh, names on your purses, you've got the right tags on your clothes. right? So here's one place 
James is telling the believers, where you can put this to the test, that you can find joy and wisdom in this trial. If you are a poor believer, you may be persecuted by the rich non-believer, but why, why should that matter to you, is his point. In whom will you find the real wisdom? The rich non-believer or the poor believer? Who should be more envied? Who is better off? If the poor, in the end, will be lifted up and exalted and brought high by God, he's going to be given the crown of life that, that God promises to those who love them. Look at that, right? Verse 12, but, uh, blessed is the one who endures. He has stood the test. He will receive the crown of life. But, and if that's you, by the way, if you find yourself where, man, I don't got much in the bank. I don't have a lot to my name. I don't have a lot of opportunity. But I have God. Then guess what? You have everything you need. It's pretty smart to, and it's pretty wise to accept that lot in life and find joy in that. But the rich unbeliever, look, he's got it all together now. He looks like everybody wants to be him. He's got all the stuff and all the relationships and everything he wants. But guess what? One day he will be humiliated. One day he will be dried up like grass in the scorching sun. If you were to walk through my front yard, you would see an example uh, of grass in the scorched sun. There are some bare places in my front yard. But it wasn't always like that because a couple of springs ago, I actually planted some grass in my front yard, in my backyard, okay? And in the spring, uh, you know, it's moist and it's cool and the grass grows really well. I'll tell you, I had some great looking grass a couple of springs ago. It was green and fresh and soft, but guess what? It is better to plant the grass in the fall than it is to plant the grass in the spring. And here's why. Because by the time the summer rolled around, the hot sun and the dry ground burned up my grass. And today I still have bare spots up there. I'm not particularly good at watering. Okay? The summertime came, the weather scorched my beautiful new grass, and now there's nothing. It's all the seeds that were planted were gone. It just died. You see, the grass didn't have the kind of root that it takes to make it through the summer just as the rich person doesn't have enough wealth to make it into eternity. Your roots are not strong enough just because you think you have wealth. And so the question James says is which is wiser? To be a poor believer or to be a rich unbeliever? The, the answer is obvious, right? Ukrainian, now, now we say Chris, I, I can appreciate that, but is it wrong to be rich? I mean, rich is better, right? In 1920s, there was a Ukrainian-born American singer by the name of Sophie Tucker, and she made this famous quote, I've been rich, I've been poor, and rich is better, right? And kind of in our hearts, we, know, we feel that rich is better, money is attractive, it can save you from problems, it can. It can make your life happier, it can. Nobody doubts that. If we, if we really claim, though, it won't make you happy, well, then you haven't had it, okay? <laughs> right? But it won't last. It won't last. You know, most people's relationship with money is a one-way conversation. Goodbye. That's most people's, you know, conversation they have with money. See you later. It's nice knowing you. It's attractive, but it won't last. So is it truly worth obsessing over money and pursuing money if you will one day be reduced to humiliation before God in the end? James makes the point that the believer has a better destiny. And what is this destiny? Blessed is the one who endures trials because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So, who is it better to be like? Who should be truly admired? Who should we pattern our lives after? The one who remains steadfast under trials. Ultimately, what determines who's blessed is who has the destination, the eternal destination with God. And who are those people? The people whose faith has been tested by fire and upon coming out on the other end, show that their faith is the real deal. That is the person 
that we pattern our lives after. So our typical response to trials is this. Let's bring this home, okay? Our typical response to trials is, when is this over? How can I get this out of my life? But the better question or response is, where is this taking me? What am I supposed to learn from this? That is the real benefit. The real, the real benefit to trials going through your life. Let me, let's take this home and leave even a little further. Moms, moms, we got a few moms here. Uh, labor. I don't mean going to work. I mean labor. Some of you have gone through labor more than others. Okay. Now, how painful was labor? How bad was labor? It was awful, right? Was this was this the worst pain you've ever had? Was labor? Okay, everyone's nodding. <laughs> it's the worst pain you've ever ever experienced in your life. And the trials we go through are kind of like labor pains. It hurts. It's difficult. It's the worst thing you've ever been through. But look at where they're taking you. Look at the results. Because at the end of labor results in life. If you throw out the pain of childbirth and with it the child, you made a foolish trade. Is it possible that in the pursuit of the ease that money can give us, that we might have traded something truly valuable for something worthless. That is Jane's point. If you have a choice between sun tanning on the beach or going through labor, moms, which would you choose? <laughs> would you rather sun tan on the beach or would you rather go through labor? Now, uh, this answer might be obvious, but maybe not so much. Because wisdom tells us this, think, of, think not of the process or the journey, but of the destination. What does sun tanning get you? Cancer. Wrinkles and sun cancer, right? Skin cancer. I was going to say nice and beautiful. <laughs> and beautiful brown skin. And what does labor get you? Joy. Family, love, and new life. So, if we think instead of the destination, instead of the process and the pain, that's where we can see the joy. You see? wisdom. Now, um, you might say, okay, James is saying that being rich is bad. I don't think that's the case. The Bible is, makes it clear that there are many people who are very wealthy throughout Scripture who are, um, who God loved. Uh, Abraham. Abraham was wealthy, one of the wealthiest people in his time. King David, King Solomon. I mean, they weren't, none of these were perfect people, but uh, Lydia in Acts. For instance, everyone who's call, uh, who has wealth is called to be a good steward of their wealth, uh, no matter how large, no, no, no matter how small. And so the point here is not that James is knocking on wealthy people. That's not his point. But rather, will you place your trust in your wealth rather than the, uh, the wisdom of pursuing losing everything for God? What are you truly seeking and what are you truly counting on? what is truly valuable. So the first misunderstanding that James addresses here is our social status. Maybe being rich isn't all it's cracked up to be. Maybe being poor isn't as bad as you think. The second thing that James addresses is his misunderstanding of ourselves. This is uh, verse 13 through 15. So back to our text. No one Undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Verse 13 says, tempted. It says, no one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. Now the word tempted is the same meaning as the trials that we've looked in verses 1 through 8. Consider it trials, a joy of trials of many kinds. And the meaning of that is simply this. There's pressure that's being put on you to test you, to see what you're made of. Okay? And I think what James is doing is he's answering an objection that someone might have about trials. They might say this, hold up, wait a second. 
if God rewards me at the end, I get a crown of life through going through these trials and I endured, maybe God's the one who's putting these trials in my way. Maybe God's the one who's making me tempted. Maybe He's the one who's setting up these struggles. Does that mean that God has this dark side? That He's kind of like, like, you know, manipulating? He's putting these obstacles in my life to trap me. What kind of God does that? So James preempts this kind of thinking by addressing this. That God might tempt, test us, but God does not tempt us. Say that again. God will test us, but He won't tempt us. We see in the Old Testament that God tests Abraham. He asks to sacrifice his son Isaac. He tests Israel. He puts them in a place where there's pagan nations all around them. He tests David. He gives them two opportunities to go and slay King Saul and take the throne. And their actions or reactions to these testings prove to whom they are loyal. And of course, many times their, their loyalty sh ends up showing that they believe in God. But this is very different from temptation because temptation is not a test per se in that you are you know, a loyalty to God, but temptation is uh, an inner desire to sin. And that doesn't come from God. That comes all from you. That desire to pursue sin comes from our own hearts. And so can we actually say, listen, if God didn't tempt me, I would not sin. Can you say that? If, if, if it weren't for God, if God didn't test me and tempt me like this, I'd, I'd live the perfect life. Come on. Nobody in their right mind would really actually be able to say that. Because given our own inclinations, given our own desires, if God had not gotten a hold of you, if not gotten a hold of me, where would you be today? Who would you be like today? You would unashamedly, actively, and gladly run towards sin. And I would too. To think God is responsible for our temptation is to have a deep misunderstanding of ourselves. A deep misunderstanding of ourselves. Because God is not the problem, as James says. Like you think you think it's God tempting you. No, it's you. Right? I'm tempted because I'm sinful. And just think about this for, for a second. When we're tempted, what do we automatically do? We point fingers. We make excuses. I was tired. You made me do it. I didn't know any better. We instinctively blame others. It was bad luck. It was bad parents. It was bad education. We, we blame not enough sleep. We blame systemic racism. <laughs> Clearly it was the white man. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we'll blame everybody. And ultimately then, when we find out that there's no one else to blame, we'll blame God. Adam did that, right? In Eden, God, it's the woman you gave me. We blame God. It's not my fault I was this way. James disagrees. Verse 14, but each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. We need to own up to that. Church, we're tempted because we're sinful. We are broken. But there's a way out, praise God. We simply need to ask God to save us. Don't put it off, right? We can't put this off because there's an urgency. We can't just say, oh, let me just sit around and play around and mess around in my sin. There's an urgency to that. Because if we don't take responsibility for our sin, the consequences will become more and more dire. Verse 15. Then, after desire has conceived... It gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to dun 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 death. Everyone say death in the lowest voice you can say. Death. Okay. Death. We misunderstand ourselves if we think we can get away with sin without consequence. The ultimate consequence, of course, is death, an end. Now look at the irony of the way that James writes this. Sin gives birth to death. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Mostly, most of the time when you give birth, it's to life. But not sin. It's literally the opposite. And so he uses this imagery of pregnancy. There's, and in pregnancy, no one gets pregnant and boop, 
there comes the baby right away. There's a time lapse. There's some time, there's nine months of gestation that happens. And the same thing with our sin. Oftentimes we'll sin and we'll look around and say, no one got hurt. Nobody knows. I've gotten away with it. But just wait. Just wait. There will be a time when all things are revealed. There will be a time where you will no longer be able to say, I've gotten away with it. It's so obvious and evident that it's come to light. Your sins will one day be known and they will lead to death. And so look at this comparison of last week. There's two processes that James says. The first process is this. Trials lead to endurance, which produces a mature believer lacking nothing. Step one, or process number one. Process number two. Um, you can uh, have desire and fulfill that desire which births sin and when sin comes to full maturity, it will lead to death. Choose your own adventure, church. Which one you gotta do, right? One or two, these are your two options. And here's the thing, unless you actively try to sabotage the process on either one, that process will run its course. There is no stopping it. Don't think that you can escape the consequence of sin, that there is no death in the end. And neither doubt that at the end of enduring trials, you will become more mature. Which will you choose? So, listen carefully. In the Bible, God does forgive, and He forgives relentlessly, and He forgives over and over and over again. And Jesus Himself says, you need to forgive 70 times 7. But don't be filled, fooled into thinking that forgiveness means no consequence. Forgiveness does not mean no consequence. There is always a consequence. Now thank God, God can do something and, and redeem things and turn them around and make something ugly into something beautiful. Oftentimes, it's not just our own sin, but other people's sin. We live in a sinful world where their sin impacts me, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of sin going on in the world that, that, that I am the quote-unquote victim of. But guess what? There's a lot of sin in the world that I've created that you are the victim of, and vice versa. But there's always a consequence to that. And when we turn to God, God can redeem that and turn that around. And this is his point. Your sin is the problem, and you're not going to get out of it on your own resources. You can no more escape the consequences of sin than you can escape giving birth after labor. And so, James starts with saying that one of our misunderstandings is our social status. That if you're rich, you think you've got it made. If you're poor, you think you don't have it made. Uh, that's a misunderstanding, he says. The second thing is he says there's a misunderstanding of ourselves that our sin has no consequence, that we can get away with it. That God really is the tempter. He says, no, let me clarify that for you. And there's a third and final uh, misunderstanding, and it's a misunderstanding about God himself. And I love this part. This part's the encouraging part. Verse 16. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. <coughs> to sum this up in one sentence, it would be this. Don't be deceived. It's not just that every gift God gives is good, but all good gifts come from God. Did you catch that? All good gifts come from God. If you want anything good in this world, if you want anything good in this world, there's only one place you can get it. It's from God. Truly good from this, this world. It's from one source, one source of blessing. It's not found in wealth. It's not found in pursuing our desires. It's found in God. There's only one place we can turn to. And God is a father of light. 
It does not change like shifting shadows, it says. So James uses this metaphor of light and darkness. Light obviously is good. Darkness obviously is evil. And God is the one who puts this light into darkness. This is his creative aspect. All the way back in Genesis, he, the, there's earth was formless and dark and there's nothing there. And God is the one who puts it there. And he puts good in an evil world. He is not the one tempting us. He's the one saving us from temptation. He's not the one that's bringing evil into the world. He's the one bringing light into darkness. All other lights may come. We may say there's, there's other good things in the world they, that's not God. Well, they may come, but they are fleeting. God's light is constant. He says that there's no flicker, no waxing or waning, no, no, no shadow, right? No shift, not like shifting shadow. There's no change. There's no season to God's light and goodness. He is good all the time. Amen. God is good all the time. God does not tempt us with evil, but the opposite. He saves us from ourselves, people who are prone to desires that lead to sin, that birth death. So, what does God's light make us? And this part, guys, this is this is powerful. What does God's light make us? Makes us first fruits. First fruits of his creatures. The first fruit is a reference to an offering, right? We often say we, we relate first fruits to give your fruits first fruits, your offering, your ten percent. Okay? This first fruit reference is when we bring this offering to God. What, what's the two qualities of the first fruits? Number one, it's first, <laughs> right? Uh, when in an agricultural society, you don't know how the harvest is going to turn out completely, right? But you're going to give it first. What first comes goes to God. And the second quality of it is it's the best. It's not just whatever, but we look for what, whatever, whatever is the, the finest, the best of quality, uh, unblemished and that's what is given to God and guess what that is exactly how James qualifies you church qualifies you believer that we are called first fruits of God a kind of first fruits we are set aside as unique as God honoring as redeemed as saved and the point is that God is not out to get us but he is out to save us and he's out to make us mature, complete, lacking nothing. Beautiful. And so how do we wrap this up? The main point is this, that the problem in the world is me. <laughs> uh, I need to recognize, man, I'm fallen, I'm broken, and I need a savior. But more than that, we have this tendency to point the finger at God and say, God, you're the reason why. Why didn't you, right? And so let's bring this home for us. Um, does that actually resonate with any of us? Do we find ourselves blaming God? Do we find ourselves saying, God, why did you let this trial happen to me? Why are you making us suffer as a people? Why am I losing my job? Why am I... Uh, why are people around me getting sick? Why are people dying? Why is there so much turmoil in the world? God, how could you let this happen? And in our bitterness and confusion, we lose sight of our sinfulness. We forget that we're sinful. In, a, in, in this bitterness and confusion, we turn towards wealth and say, how can I protect myself and make things better for myself with my wealth? And James says, man, don't do that. Don't do that. The point James is making is that God has stepped in to save you and not to harm you. Had he not done that, we would have totally and completely run ourselves to the ground. We would have destroyed ourselves and probably everyone else around with us. So when you start to ask yourselves the question, well, why me? Why me, God? James says, stop for a second and be wise about this. You know why you. You know why you because you're a sinful person. You live in a sinful world, and you're a sinner in need of grace, and you're in a world in need of, in need of God's grace. God knows, owes you nothing, but we come to Him, not because of anything in me, but because of God's 
total and complete rescue plan for me. And that's the negative side, right? The negative side is like we're sinners. But the flip side of this, just to summarize what we've been talking about, is God is the only good source of every good thing. If we want any good thing in this life, there is a place to find it. And that is in our Heavenly Father. Father of lights. In Him there is no shifting shadow. Any Princess Bride uh, lovers out there? Any, anyone be able, able to quote Princess Bride? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, here we go. Alright, Kia, see if you know this one. Life is pain, Highness. Finish it. Yeah. Life is pain, Your Highness. Anyone who says otherwise is selling you something. <laughs> Alright. A good Christian quote. <laughs> Life is pain. There is suffering. There is trial in this world. Anyone who shows you, like, just pursue happiness, pursue your desires, pursue your wealth, is trying to sell you something. Christianity doesn't promise health, wealth, and prosperity, but it does promise that wherever the Father allows you to go through, listen carefully, whatever the Father allows you to go through can be redeemed for His good. He was always the source of all good gifts. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, God. Thank you that each of us does go through trials. Lord, the, the story of the young pastor who went to the mentor and asked him, um, how, do, how can I become more, more mature? Pray for my maturity. And the pastor, older pastor, closed his eyes and bowed his head and said, Lord, please bring great trials and suffering to this young man. God, we don't like hearing that. We don't, we don't want it. But help us say like Jesus said in the garden, not my will, but yours be done. God, help us clearly see and have the wisdom to clearly see the purpose of our pains, the purpose of our sufferings. And God, help us to trust that you know what you're doing. Trust you. That all good things come for you. That's all you give to us is good things. And if I don't get the gifts that I want, then maybe the, there's nothing else that's really worth having. And so God, I ask for wisdom and I ask for peace and I ask that we as a church would praise you and recognize that you are our Father of Light in whom there is no shifting shadow. And we thank you, God. Bring more and more light and life into our church, into our lives. For those of us who are going through our, those processes of suffering, let us remember, God, that it, at the end, it leads and in, it, it inevitably leads to the mature believer who has everything they need, lacking nothing. In this we pray.